Okay guys, so uh, welcome back to another Easy EKG uh, video. I had a request the other day uh, for a better explanation, or I guess more of an explanation, about the differences between premature ventricular beats, um, whether they're superventricular or uh, ventricular, and then the difference between atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation. So I made a quick little PowerPoint here, we'll go over that. <clears throat> Let's uh, get started. So. This is, uh, we're dealing with the premature ventricular contractions, um, or I guess just premature beats. Um, and the main way they classify them is they're either superventricular or they're ventricular. And basically just anything that originates from above the AV node is going to be from a superventricular etiology. So it's going to be a superventricular tachycardia or superventricular premature beat or something like that. Anything that originates from the ventricles uh, or below the AV node, below the uh, atrial ventricular septum is going to be a ventricular uh, origin. So a premature ventricular contraction or a ventricular tachycardia. So that's the main difference between superventricular and ventricular is just it's the location. Anything besides the ventricles and then everything that are the ventricles, okay? So let's start talking about the premature beats. So uh, we're going to go and start with uh, premature atrial contractions, which would be considered a superventricular premature beat um, because it's coming from above the ventricles. So um, basically there's three main ECG features that we see. Um, you have a premature, often abnormally shaped P wave, um, which remember the P wave is when the atrial contract. Mm, excuse me. Uh, we also have a relatively normal QRS um, because when the P wave does fire early or is firing normally, uh, it's still going to use the uh, his Purkinje system, so you're going to have a normal QRS complex. It's not going to be widened or anything because we're using the actual conduction pathway. Uh, and the other thing is there is no compensatory pause. Okay, so um, when we have premature atrial contractions, you also can have the P waves can be there, they can be hidden, they can be smaller. Um, you could also have an abnormal QRS if you had a bundle branch block, for example, um, and you could have a compensatory pause sometimes. So it's essentially, you can have compensatory pauses sometimes, sometimes you can't. However, the most common cause of a pause on the ECG is a non-conducted atrial premature beat. So make sure, this is really important to know, but premature atrial contraction is the most common reason why you see a pause on an EKG. So let's actually look at um, some EKGs about them. So um, this is first slide here. We're talking about uh, differentiating between a PVC, which is a premature ventricular contraction, and a PAC, which is a premature atrial contraction. So uh, line A here demonstrates PVCs, and line B demonstrates PACs. So we can clearly see this big blob right here is not uh, like anything else. So this is a PVC. And we'll get into that here in just a second about what those look like. Um, down here, this is consistent with a PAC or a premature atrial contraction. So uh, we have our P wave here. And we have our QRS and then our T. P wave, QRS, T. P wave, QRS. And then we have a P probably inside that T wave, which causes a QRS to fire. So it's firing early, but now all the cells, when they are re polarizing, they're still in the refractory period, so you cannot hit it with another P wave, if that makes sense, because they've already repolarized, so they're in the refractory period, which in the refractory period of a muscle, it doesn't matter how hard of a stimulus you hit the muscle with, it's never going to contract. So when you have this premature atrial contraction, it causes this PVC, or this, um, not PVC, but it causes this QRS complex, the ventricles contract, but they contract it earlier than they normally would. So now the cells are going to be in a refractory state when the other P wave hits, or there's not going to be another P wave because it's in a refractory state. So um, this one's kind of an older looking version, but the newer ones um, are a little more finite. Um, we'll be able to see those here coming up. Um, so again, this is a premature atrial contraction. Um, these are what they call couplets um, or a two to one uh, atrial bigeminy, I think is what they'd like to call it. Um, and it's just all terminology. It doesn't it's really not important that you know that. 
Um, but so basically we have a lead one here, AVF and V3. Um, they're all the same lead, or they're all measured from the same time. So we have our P wave, QRS, T, P wave, QRS, T, and then we have our pause. And then P wave, QRS, T, P wave, QRS, T. So now it's really tricky here, but you have to look and see the difference between this T wave here and this T wave here. Notice how this first one's a little bigger than the second one? It's bigger because there's actually a P wave inside of this one. Oops. There's actually a, an additional P wave inside this T wave, and that's what is causing this second QRS to fire. And so we have that break. And so here you can see down here again, um, this is just demonstrating um, the bigeminy. So you have two P waves for a QRS complex, and then you drop one because here's another P wave inside this T wave, and it's dropped. So we have our QRS that fires. In this instance, when it's firing, this is from a probably a uh, ventricular spontaneous depolarization, which when the ventricles are not getting enough stimulus, um, they will fire spontaneously. Um, it's called an exit or escape rhythm, um, and it's just to keep you alive, I guess, if you're not receiving any signals. So that's probably what this is. Um, this is kind of a, it's a more difficult example, but essentially it's just whenever your atria are, atria are contracting premature to when they actually should. And so here's another example. This one's kind of hard to see, but um, you can see here's a QRS here, here's a QRS here, and a QRS here. So we have a P wave here, QRS, T, P wave, QRS, and then we have another P wave before this T wave, but the P wave is not um, going to be able to trigger the QRS because it's before the T wave, right? And so the T wave is the repolarization of the ventricles. So if the ventricles haven't repolarized yet, you can't hit them with another stimulus. So that's why this P wave isn't conducted. So we have our QRS and then we have our P wave, then we have our T wave. So the P wave is not conducted. Our next P wave is conducted as we see here in this QRS complex, followed by another P wave and then another T wave and then another P wave and then our QRS complex. And then in this situation, we have our P wave that's on top of our T wave, which is not going to elicit a contraction whatsoever. And that's why you have this pause right here. And you can see this P wave inside this T wave here in this location. And this is called atrial bigeminy. So you have um, the situation that's going on here is you have two P waves for every one QRS. So we have a P wave inside this T wave. Then here's another P wave, which gives us one QRS. So we have one P wave, two, wave, two P waves, and this is our QRS. So two to one, so bigeminy. Here's another example of the, so QRS here, QRS here. So our P, or we have our um, P wave with our T wave and then our P wave again. Then we have our P wave inside of our T wave or a little before the T wave and we do not have a, Q, or a QRS complex so the ventricles are not firing. So those are PACs or premature atrial contractions. Now we're going to get into the PVCs, which are the premature ventricular contractions. So um, these are the ones that can be pathologic. The pre or the premature atrial contractions aren't necessarily going to be as pathologic as a PVC can. Um, but so PVCs have a wide, bizarre QRS complex, um, usually greater than 0.12 seconds, um, which is the maximum width that you want to have for a QRS. Um, you don't have a P wave because there is no stimulus that's signaling these to go. It's actually just a spontaneous depolarization. Your ST will often slope away from your QRS um, and you can sometimes have a compensatory pause. So let's look here. So the first thing I like to do is I'll look and I'll say, okay, what do we have the majority of on here that look the same? So this is the same as this, is the same as this, same as this. So these all look pretty similar. And then we got this oddball right here. And we can tell right away that that is not like anything else that we see on this strip. So we can determine this is a PVC. Okay. Um, when we come down here, and this is just a spontaneous one. Notice how there's four and then it's followed by four normal ones. So there's really nothing um, uh, repetitive about this. It's just a, a spontaneous PVC. A lot of people will have them if you're, um, you know, in your mid 20s, you're on a lot of caffeine, you're stressed, you can have. PVCs all the time. It's when you feel your heart skip a beat sometimes. That's what a PVC is. So um, notice there is no uh, P wave here in front of this QRS complex. You might think this is a little P wave. Eh, it's really not. Um, 
let's see here. Actually, yeah, I'd say this is probably a P wave, but the ventricle depolarized before that P wave could actually signal down to the AV complex or the AV junction. So just pretend that there isn't one here. This is just a spontaneous depolarization. Just know that it is different than everything else in here, okay? When we look down here on the bottom one. These are uh, ventricle by Gemini. So we have a normal, here's our QRS, so P, Q, R, S, T. And then we have this oddball looking deal. And this is not normal. Remember, look how thin our QRS complex is here. This is what, one, two boxes, maybe three boxes. And this is one, two, three, four, maybe five boxes. Um, just for the beginning, so we'll, we'll multiply that. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that's about ten second or um, 0.2 seconds for our QRS complex to fire. That's not normal. Um, but so the reason why this is by Gemini is we have QRS and then we have a PVC and then one QRS that's normal and then one PVC, one QRS, one PVC, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Here's another example. Um, this is be ventric or ventricular by Gemini. This would be trigemini and this would be quadrigemini. So um, we have our normal QRS, so P QRS, and then we have our PVC. This is not normal. It doesn't look anything else like anything on here. Um, another thing to note too is they all look the same. These PVCs all look the same, right? So when they all look the same, you know that they are coming from the same part of the heart, which is important to know because if you have a bunch of different funky looking PVCs that all look different, you know that you have multiple areas on the heart that are spontaneously depolarizing. And we'll go into that on a different slide here in a second. But so P, Q, R, S, and then we have our PVC, which is not normal. P, Q, R, S, PVC. So it's a one-to-one, -one, so that's bigeminy, right? We come down here, this is trigeminy. So we have one normal QRS, two normal QRSs, and then one PVC. One normal, two normal, and then a PVC. So that's trigeminy. And then we come down to the bottom. I don't really understand why they call it a quadrigeminy, but you have two normal QRSs with two abnormal PVCs. That's what quadrigeminy is, apparently. So. Um, here is what I was talking about with the multi-form PVCs. So um, we have to first find out what our normal QRSs are. And so here's here's one here that's normal. Here's one here that's normal. And here's one here that's normal. So this is a PVC. This is a PVC. This is a PVC. This is a PVC. And this is a PVC. Notice how they all look different. That's not good because we have multiple areas of the heart that are spontaneously depolarizing. And that usually means that there is necrosis, or not necrosis, but ischemia in that part of the heart. So if we have multiple PVCs, we have multiple areas of ischemia, which is quite bad. So, uh, and then the last thing we'll talk about with the PVCs are, um, it's kind of nice to be able to differentiate between whether it's a light, a light, excuse me, a left versus a right PVC. So the left P, or left uh, ventricular premature depolarizations, that's what BPD stands for, uh, more, they're more commonly associated with heart disease. Um, right ventricular depolarizations or spontaneous depolarizations occur in normal people. So that's the ones that I told you about with the caffeine and the stress and when you feel your heart skip. Uh, left ventricular depolarization or spontaneous depolarizations are more likely to cause V-fib. Um, and that can happen uh, during your QMI, what we talked about with your ischemia causing the spontaneous sleep depolarizations. Um, so you can read about all this. Basically, it's pretty blatant. A left PVC is skinnier and it has a double peak where the right PVC is going to be huge. It has a huge waveform. So um, here's a left PVC right here. You can see how it kind of looks like a right bundle branch block. If you don't know what that is, don't worry. It's not important. But just note that there are, it's a wide QRS and then we have not one, but two little peaks. So it kind of looks like a pair of mountains. That's a left ventricle premature. On the bottom here we have a wide, blatantly wide, um, with a huge hump after the PVC. That is a right ventricular PVC. Those are just, these are the easiest ones to pick out. Most of the programs you'll see that are practicing EKGs on will have these to be demonstrated. Okay, now we're going to quickly go through a flutter and a fib. Um, so a flutter is uh, it's generally a regular rhythm. The atrial rates are around 300 a minute. 
um, and those waves that you see are called F waves, and they look like saw tooth, or their saw tooth appearance like. Um, so this is essentially an A flutter. So you have kind of know how it looks like a saw. We're not looking at the bottom because the bottom is the PV or the uh, ventricular contractions, the QRSs. We're looking at the top here, and the top kind of looks like a saw. So notice how they're really sharp and pointy. So if we look at the rate of these, um, so let's see here. 300, 150, so it's around 150 to 200 per minute, which is consistent with a flutter. Uh, notice how it's regular, so we'll check um, 300, 150 for the QRSs. Let's go over here and check it. Um, let's see, we'll do this one, 300, 150, so yeah, it's a little under 150. It's consistent. Um, when we compare that to a fib, we'll notice that it's really irregular. So here's another one you can tell. Um, note how you're able to see distinct um, F waves. Uh, it's really evident here in lead three. So you can see uh, here's an F wave, here's an F wave, here's an F wave. And notice how they're almost, they're around 300 um, beats per minute, a little under 300 beats per minute. Um, that's, this is a characteristic A flutter. Here's another example of A flutter. Um, notice how it's not fibrillations, it's not like a bag of worms, it's actually a contraction. We'll, still, we'll show you here what the fibrillation is in a second. But AFib, know that it's the most common arrhythmia in the U.S. A lot of people live with it. Um, it's very benign, very treatable. You just got to put them on some, anti, some uh, anticoagulants. Um, a lot of times you can cardiovert them if you think it's necessary, if they have other um, uh, issue or problems from the, the uh, arrhythmia. Um, you have your F waves. Um, they're very irregular, so it's irregularly, irregularly irregular is what we've been taught. Uh, the rate is around 450 to 600, so it's super fast. Remember that the uh, atrial flutter is around 200 to 300 per minute, so um, it's easier to dif differentiate. So notice how, let's look at the QRSs. The QRSs are not equally spaced whatsoever. They're all randomized. It's really random. Um, note how the or isoelectric line is super all over the place, really wobbly. Um, it's not more sharp, kind of like the A flutter is. So if you were able to calculate a rate, it would be super high, but this one's too jumbled to do that. Um, here is a, another example. Notice how the isoelectric line is just kind of quivering back and forth, um, which is characteristic with A flut or uh, A fib. <clears throat> Um, the other thing to note, too, is you can have a coarse atrial fibrillation and a fine atrial fibrillation. So this top one is a coarse, and the bottom one is very fine. So it's almost so fine you can't even see it. Um, so we look at the rates here. So let's look at this rate here. So this is 300, 150. So we have a rate of 150 here. We go over to this one, and we have a rate of 300, probably around 175 or so, 170 which is not regular whatsoever. This one's another 150. We go over here and we have another 175. So it's just all over the place. It's irregularly irregular. Um, here I think is my last slide. This is just a normal 12 leads. So you have leads 1, 2, 3, AVR, AVL, AVF, and then our precordial leads over here. And then these are just the extended leads down here. <clears throat> so we look at V1 and notice it's just all over the place. The isoelectric line is not flat. It's like a quivering bag of worms. Um, we can see that we uh, don't have a regular rate. Um, so this would be 300, 150, 175. And then we count here. This is 300, 150, 100. And then this would be a little over 75. Um, let's try this one. That's four, four. This one's a little more around the five area. So 300, 150, 175, 60. So a little over 60. So it's not very regular um, in any case. So um, this is just my resources slide. All these PowerPoint EKGs were provided by our cardiology professor, Dr. Gary Hoff. Um, if you have any questions, uh, be sure to let me know. I hope this helped clear some things up between the differences of AFib and a flutter versus uh, PVCs and um, PACs. So uh, thanks for watching. I uh, hope to uh, give me a thumbs up if you like the video. Thanks.